Well, uh, you know your nursery rhymes, right? So um, I'm sure you know this old one. Uh, it, uh, it does a good job of kind of encapsulating what Revelation 18 is all about, and we'll see today. It goes something like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And then all the king's horses and all the king's men... Yeah, they couldn't put them back together again. So uh, that's Revelation 18. <laughs> In a nutshell, that's kind of what it's all about. The fallen world's final ruling emperor, global leader, the Antichrist, will be a lot like Humpty Dumpty. He, uh, he will sit atop his political, economic, uh, religious wall, thinking he has the world at his command. Those in Davos, uh, those uh, globalists, those European Union folks are going to feel like they're so smug and woke and cool that they got it all. Um, then suddenly, he's going to have a great fall and uh, it's not going to be able to recover. Uh, all the king's horses, all the king's allies, all the king's merchants will be powerless to do anything about it. They will stand at a distance and wail and weep as they see the world system crash into chaos. And there's not going to be much they can do. But before Humpty Dumpty has a fall, before everything crashes, God's going to give an, an, another warning to the people of the world, to you and I. Get out of Babylon. Get out of the world system. Get out of the woke weirdness. Get out now. It's going to crash. It's not going to last. This is not something you want to put your stock in. Um, now, as I was perusing scripture, I was reminded there are lots of places where God warns us to get out. Uh, seven come to mind, seven places where he says basically flee Babylon or flee Rome or flee Washington, D.C. Flee the, the craziness of the, of the day. Get out. Out. In other words, God has always been in the business of saying, if you're part of a godless system, get out. Separate yourself. That's what it means to be sacred, to be set apart. You're supposed to be different. You're not supposed to be colluding with the world. And of course, under the uh, conditions of the tribulation, the situation will be so harsh and lethal, um, it'll be hard for people to get out. They're going to want some materialistic, hedonistic, something to appease them because there's going to be a lot going on. But uh, God's going to warn them, uh, don't take the mark of the beast. Don't, don't do the crazy government mandate stuff. Get out while you can. And uh, there's lots of places, again, like I said in scripture, that come to mind. Uh, perhaps the one that comes to mind the most is the story of Lot. Do you remember the story of Lot in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19. Uh, angels come to Lot and they say this. Lot, because <laughs> you are like, you, you're part of the bridge and you love God and you're following me. Um, whoever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. God's going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, but beforehand he sends an angel to Lot and says, I'm, God wants you to have a warning. Get out before the destruction, before the, the judgment. And Lot does. He tells his loved ones, particularly his wife, and they head out. But what happens with his wife? She looks back. I haven't redeemed all my Starbucks coupons. <laughs> what about my Brighton jewelry certificate? What about the outlet malls? Something about the system, she just was having a hard time leaving. And that was it. God's like, you, you can't turn back when it comes to me. When you've been warned by an angelic angel to get out, and here you're being warned by God's holy word, get out, and you look back, no. 
John wrote this, of course he's recording Revelation for us, but in his epistle or letter, 1 John 2, 15 and 17, he's very clear, do not love the world or the things in the world. That's not like don't love a good coffee or don't love family and friends or a good day at the beach or seeing a deer, you know, go across the woods. This is the Greek word cosmos. It means world system. Not like there's not good things on the planet, but don't love the world system or the, the way the world system works. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in you. How, how clear can that be? For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, this is not from the Father. It's from the world system. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God will abide forever. Uh, so this isn't brand new to Revelation. You know, we're not to love the world. Perhaps you remember Jesus himself when he told the parable of uh, four soils. He was sowing seed and he says, let me tell you a little story. And the seed's going to fall among four soils, four different kinds of ground. And one of them, the seed's going to start and it's going to grow, but the worries of the world, the preoccupations of the world system and making money and how we're going to do it and all, are going to choke the word and it won't be fruitful. Like Jesus himself gave a warning, like, don't get caught up in the system. Seek first the kingdom. And those are, I know you need those things. Those will come. But if you get preoccupied, you're going to get choked out. Paul said it this way to the Romans. Do not be conformed to this world. The, this way of thinking. This kind of pagan, heathen preoccupation. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, we have to be careful because the world doesn't want you to love God or his word. It wants you to love yourself. And I, you hear it, I hear it every day. <laughs> You're the most important one of all. You know, do good things for yourself. Love yourself. Be good to yourself. Pamper yourself. If you can't love you, you can't love your... And it's like, oh, you're kidding me. It's just the cuckooest, craziest nuttiest stuff but love yourself you'll ruin yourself get out of that turn to God so with that why don't we turn to Revelation 18 and uh, let's do the first we'll do eight verses today how about that and then uh, I'm going to give you a little more prep about it and then we'll just unpack it Revelation 18, starting in verse 1. John says, After this, I saw another angel. This is a vision he has, that this angel is coming down from heaven. He had great authority. And the earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice, the angel shouts out, Fallen! Fallen! Is Babylon the great? She's become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries, and the kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people. Get out. So that you will not share in her sins. So that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she's done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her death, mourning, 
and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. This is our passage for today. Well, if I could go back in history, you know that the uh, history is replete <laughs> with petty kingdoms and empires built by proud, arrogant, God-rejecting rebels. They're, you just have to study history. The spirit of humanism has been going on all a long time. And of course, the empires of the world are always unshakably optimistic, even though we have so many wars and slaughters and injustice and cruelty. Even though you can study the, the crazy life of Mao and Stalin and Mussolini and Hitler, people still are enamored with socialism. It's like, <laughs> have you not looked at history? Have you not learned anything? It's nutty. But they want a utopia. They want something without God. And so they have to come up with something. They have to put their preoccupation into science and progress and the upward mobility, even though they don't see that man is getting more and more degenerate, even though we have more and more technology. Fortunately, God can't be easily replaced, and nor can his plans be easily thwarted. Um, scripture says, and I was just perusing a few scriptures, but Acts 14, 16 stood out to me. It says that God permitted all the nations to go their own way. God has permitted nations to go wayward. And they're gone. Egyptian Empire is gone. The Medo-Persian Empire is gone. The Greek, amazing Greek. I mean, you can visit the Acropolis, but the whole empire crumbled like the... The building itself, the grandeur of Rome is gone. Have you gone to Italy recently? Beautiful, but it's, an, it's, a, it's beautiful memories of another empire. Now, they're living in socialistic craziness right now. You can't even afford bread and regular things without paying an arm and a leg. Psalm 2 talks about the kings of the earth, you know, fighting against God. But it says the Lord scoffs at them. It's like empires have come and gone. There's only one that's going to last. In fact, compared to the indescribable majesty of our omnipotent God, all of man's vaunted empires are just, according to Isaiah 40, just a drop from a bucket. <laughs> the empires are just a drop from a bucket. Or as Isaiah 40, 15 all goes on to say, it's, it's a speck of dust on the scales. That's it. It goes on to say, they are nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing. They're meaningless. All these amazing empires, they're gone. The inescapable reality is that God, not man, will have the last word in human history, and the end of human history is coming. And that last word is judgment. So get out while you can. Get out now. Don't participate in the craziness of the world system. Job says that judgment is coming. The wicked is reserved for the day of calamity. They will be led forth on that day of fury. Job 21. So this whole concept of judgment is coming. It's been talked about for a long time. David said the Lord has established his throne for judgment. And he will judge the world in righteousness. That's nothing new. Psalm 96 says it. God is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples of his faithfulness. Nothing new. Isaiah says it. According to their deeds, God will repay wrath to his adversaries. He will recompense his enemies. Like this whole concept that <laughs> judgment day is coming, the, the crazy thing is that it hasn't come yet. I mean, there have been judgments along the way, but like the final judgment, he's been so patient. So long-suffering, and so are we called to be that as well. Jesus described this coming day of judgment when he was here on earth on his first coming. He says, recorded for us in Matthew 13, So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. At the end of the age, the angels will come forth they will take out the wicked from among the righteous and then he's going to throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he tries to give, you know, you farmers know this, you, you separate the wheat and the tares and 
the tears you burn up, they're not good for anything. That's going to happen in the end. I mean, Jesus was like, just heads up, everyone. That's going to happen in the end. And here we are in Revelation 18. We're getting near the end. So there's really no place to kind of go, whoa, I had no idea. <laughs> it's like this has been talked about for a long time. Paul told the Greek philosophers gathered on Mars Hill, recorded for us in Acts 17. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world. Hello, Epicureans, Stoic philosophers, all you super philosophical academic people. God's fixed a day. He's going to judge the world. That's going to happen. He told the Thessalonians, Paul told the Thessalonians, the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who don't know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. Like this is, again, not new. Peter includes it in his letter. 2 Peter 2, 9. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly, which he does, and keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. So we're at the end of our 66 book canon from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We're at the end but all throughout, from the Old Testament to the New, there's a day's coming. You're going to be accountable for how you live. Get out of the craziness. Get out of the madness. Don't participate. Don't collude. Don't compromise with the nutty stuff. It doesn't matter if you're living in the first century under Rome or the present century under the globalist. Get out of it. Do what you can to be separate from it. Because judgment <coughs> is coming. Now in Revelation we have seen several judgments. We saw the seven seal judgments. We've seen the seven trumpet judgments. We have seen the seven bowl judgments. So it's like, okay, clue in people. <laughs> and now we're past all of that. And last time together in Revelation 17 we saw that there's going to be a religious crazy system that's going to rise up, a one world religion, and God's going to judge that. Now we're in chapter 18, and he's now going to say there's also going to be a one world political economic system, and God's going to judge that. You're not to put a coexist sticker on the back of your car because it doesn't work that way. There's only one person who's conquered death, and it's Jesus Christ. I hate to be snotty about it. I don't want to be narrow-minded, but if you die, there's only one person who's conquered death, and Muhammad wasn't it. There's a lot we can learn from Muslims and Mormons and people of different faiths or cults. There's all kinds of amazing truths. I've traveled a lot of countries of the world like many of you and there's stuff we can learn and love from everyone. But when it comes to like who's going to judge and who's going to save, there's only one I know who's conquered death. It wasn't Confucius. It wasn't Gandhi. I mean, it's Jesus. So there you go. Super inconvenient truth. <laughs> I'm always open to another one who's conquered death, but they just never come up with one. <laughs> I still think OJ did it. But if you have another <laughs> if you have another theory, like bring it. Like give me some DNA or something. Come on, a fingerprint or s you got to have something else. It's easy to criticize, but uh, that tomb's still empty. We we have a real problem. And uh, Jesus, I believe has solved it. Anyways, Chapter 17 was kind of the spiritual Babylon, which, which gets judged. Today we're in chapter 18, and next time together we'll finish up 18. It is the political commercial side. It's going to get judged too. So there's two Babylons, really, the spiritual and the political, if you will, the moral and the economic. They're both corrupt. They're both led by the Antichrist. They're both blas blasphemous in both systems. The religious and the political both kill believers. That's true believers. Uh, the spiritual Babylon is called Mystery Babylon or an, uh, a mother of harlots. Here we're going to see that the economic Babylon is called Babylon the Great or Babylon probably better translated the very influential one. Uh, the spiritual Babylon is a woman guilty of religious evil. Here the economic Babylon is like, uh, named as like a great city that's guilty of commercial greed. 
The spiritual Babylon was destroyed by the Antichrist because he uses religion to gain power in the world. But as soon as he gains that power, remember, he kills out the religion because he wants to be worshipped. So everything's gone except him. Just like the Roman emperors in the first century. We want you to worship and bow to us. Just like we're seeing a little bit today. You need to bow to the state. I, I got canceled on LinkedIn this last week. <laughs> So I'm appealing my case and they're listening and I've been down for seven days and we're, we're talking about it but they gave me three posts over the last year that they're not too happy with. Maybe I'll share them someday. They're so innocuous it's ridiculous but you got to be a part of the party system or there's going to be consequences. And uh, that's why God says eventually don't worry this all is going to get judged. And here in chapter 18, the corrupt, crony, capitalist, commercial, consumerism of Babylon is going to get its final funeral. Um, this is Satan's last greatest human empire that he's been using, and uh, Christ is going to take care of it. Now, a quick word about the Antichrist, this government leader that's going to rise up. He's super smart. He is going to be super amazing, by the way, <laughs> just... So you know, it's not going to be, he's not just a knucklehead. Um, think of the cascade of catastrophes that have already occurred in Revelation. The earth has been burned, the mountains have fallen from heaven, the sun has scorched men with fire, darkness has blanketed the earth, springs of water have been poisoned, the oceans have died, and so much more. And yet this Antichrist is going to build this materialistic um, system. This, he's going to rebuild the world. They're going to be like the Dubai of the 21st century. So exciting. Now Babylon, I don't know if in this passage, if it's a literal city, it could be. Uh, there are people who think that Babylon in the Middle East is going to be rebuilt literally on the ancient site. That's possible. Um, Babylon could be a code name for another city like DC or Moscow or Beijing or something or in the first century for John it was Rome. They certainly saw the opulence of Rome but the evil underneath Rome, John knew that firsthand. And I don't know, in my opinion it's probably a metaphor for both. It probably will be a literal city that will be like the capital nerve center of evil but it's also a system that permeates kind of worldwide. Uh, <laughs> along with apparently Amazon and all of those other entities that collude with this enterprise. By the way, you know Saddam Hussein who was killed back in 2006, he wanted to build up Babylon to be the new world epicenter. He claimed that he himself would be the new Nebuchadnezzar. And um, just so you know, this isn't crazy stuff, even after he's passed, the Iraqis are still continuing his reconstruction project and just interesting tidbit uh, President Obama and his administration gave a seven hundred thousand dollar gift to this future Babylon uh, I'm sure you didn't hear about it in the news what a surprise um, but there are people who think it'll be the literal Babylon and I guess it it could be they do have a lot of oil and a lot of interesting things are happening in the Middle East so who knows but the nature of Babylon as we're going to see as we unpack today's passage is a place for demons it's a prison for foul spirits it's just all the craziness that goes on goes on in this literal city but also this met this system if you will in other words Rome of the first century that John was aware of is getting replicated today in another like new Rome whether you call that the European Union or whatever and it will be the kind of the, the Davos, you know, that we're reading about. It'll be the capital. It'll be the Mecca of Meism, the, the Vegas of vanity. It will be the mother of all evils. Like Paris, it'll be like high culture, like uh, maybe Jerusalem. It'll have all the world religions there. Um, like D.C., it'll be a place of political power. It's going to be a monstrous, menacing megalopolis, if you will. But uh, it'll it'll be a... It'll be a nightmare, but the good news is it's not going to last. God's taking it out, and therefore the warning to you and I is, get out. <laughs> get out. Lot. 
Take your wife. Don't look back. <laughs> it's not good. Don't look back. Just, just go. So today we do see um, Babylon is throwing all kinds of pride parades and drag queen school assemblies and abortion parties and carrying out all kinds of lies and they're celebrating it. And it's going to be like that in the future Babylon as well until one day God's like, game over. Enough. <laughs> it's just nutty. Enough. And uh, even though the world will be going capitalistic, berserk, by the way, it's not going to go communist. The future world will be very capitalistic, but in overdrive. Like people are just going to be hoarding for things and money and stealing and black markets and grabbing what they can and cheating and cutting corners. And uh, no one's going to be like, we just all want our fair share. You know, no one wants to own anything. Yeah, no, that, the fallen people aren't going to fall for that. It's going to be materialism gone manic. It's going to be like a lust for luxury. And God's going to say, get out. Just get out. Okay. So are you ready to go now verse by verse and unpack that? That's a little background. Um, we've already read the passage. Let's just unpack it together. We've got eight verses. It's quick. We can do it. We can do it. Humpty Dumpty is going to have a great fall, but before he falls, get out. Okay. <laughs> you got the point already, right? That's the punchline. Okay. Let's go to verse one. We see the lament over fallen Babylon, the doom of this city of darkness, if you will. It says in verse one, John says, after this, after following the vision that I had in chapter 17 about the religious doom, uh, I got this vision from a another angel who came down, actually descends from heaven, uh, and he had this incredible great authority, this immense power, of course, delegated by God, and the earth, which by the way was dark at the time because there was a lot of darkness on the earth, was illuminated by his splendor. So John says, get this, this vision starts off, the city is dark, I mean the world is dark, and God sends an angel just, just so luminous and bright and illuminating, impressive, and has all the delegated authority that God would give, like this is like, <laughs> like wow, listen up, this is, Spectacular. I mean, this is Disney fireworks gone cuckoo. Amazing. Super dramatic. Brilliant and glorious. Verse 2. With a mighty, could be translated powerful, strong, thunderous voice, the angel shouts out without hesitation or stuttering or, you know, no one can ignore him. Everyone's going to hear him. Fallen. Fallen. Could be translated ruined. Ruined is Babylon the great, the influential. The godless globalist are done. Now notice there's a double fall here because we have the spiritual moral fall and we have the political economic. Fallen, fallen, both, all of it is gone. Why? Well, the angel says she's become a dwelling place, a home, for demons, for the demonic. It's a ghost town for evil that's left. And a haunt for every pure, unclean, impure spirit. I mean, we're seeing some of that today. We're not even at the end end. So like, just the debauchery and the craziness that you want to teach kindergartners and the muck that's being tolerated and taught. Nutty. She's a dwelling place for impure stuff. And she's a haunt for every unclean bird, every vulture, if you will, and a haunt or a prison or a garrison for every unclean, loathsome, detestable animal. It could be probably better translated, hateful beasts. It's, I think he's not just talking about <laughs> animals. I think he's talking about people. Babylon, this whole world system, has a lot of hateful, yucky people. Brutal. People bite. These people want to take you out. And these people want to send IRS, IRS agents and try to figure something out about you. They want to dig stuff up. They're gonna, they, they don't mind creating chaos. They, they don't mind accusation and innuendo. I mean, what, it's going to bankrupt you. What are you going to do? Defend yourself? You don't have enough money to do it. Verse 3. 
Another reason they're so evil is for all the nations, that's all the people on the planet, have drunk, they've guzzled, they've downed the maddening, passionate, wild wine of her adulteries, her whoring, her sexual immorality, her promiscuity, her, her fornication. And the kings of the earth who've disgraced themselves have committed adultery. Again, they've fornicated or been totally immoral. Another way to say it is they've, they've slept with her. The world system, the kings of the world have slept with her. They're colluding with her. They're in bed with her. Uh, they've gone to Epstein's Island. Apparently they've cut deals with the CCP. Uh, they have under table treasonous deals that get them money and kickbacks and they're all part of the system. And the FBI and the CIA could be colluding with Facebook and, and LinkedIn and who knows, apparently <coughs> Instagram, I don't know. Uh, they all seem like they're feeding information about the citizens to the world government so that they can control you and survey you and find out if you're compliant or out of line and then they can take points away from you, social points, because you're not doing what the system wants you to do. They're totally in bed with this. And by the way, it says they, and the merchants of the earth, the, the businessmen throughout the world, the, the greedy, materialistic, unethical entrepreneurs, if you will, they grow rich from her excessive lux luxuries. I, I think I was just reading this week about the CEO, was it of Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, uh, did some crazy shady thing and jumped off 19 stories of a hotel building and killed himself because he's going to be exposed. Like, uh, if you're the CEO of Bed Bath & Beyond, I think you probably make good money. I'm thinking more than a pastor. I don't know. I could be wrong, but... <laughs> Um, like, but there's, it's not enough. It's not enough. They want more. They, they grow rich and excessive uh, with being in bed with all these crazy inside trading people. They're part of the, the system. They don't have self-control. They don't have self-restraint. They're not willing to self-govern. They want to get away with whatever they can. It's wild wantonness and, and mindless, materialistic merriment. And God's like, party's coming to an end. You guys see it. It's crazy. People live in the freest country in the world. If you live in this state, you've got great weather and there's great people here. And like there's so much to be grateful for, but maybe it's not enough. Maybe I need another car and another beach house and... Another sea dew, and if you do get a sea dew, let me know. <laughs> just saying, just saying, because I'm not going to get a sea dew. Sue, you'd let me go, right? Uh, so if I know someone with a sea dew. <laughs> Anyways. So there's a warning here in the midst of all of this craziness. God still steps in and says, instead of just like, it's evil, they're demonic, it's like darkness, it's crazy, I'm judging this. He's like, let me pause here and say, if you get it, and you may have not gotten it up till now, but if you're still listening, verse 4, get out. I'll, I'll give you another chance. Even if you've colluded with the, the Nazis this long, the communists this long, Stalin's party this long, Mussolini's, Mao's, you name it, you are in a build back better mode and you realize build back Babel is not the answer, get out. Because John says, then I heard another voice shouting from heaven and it says, come out of her! Like, get out of that city, that system, that cesspool. My people, as fast as you can. Don't get caught up in the craziness. That's for us today, by the way. This isn't just here to say, by the way, in the future, well, that's literally going to happen in the future, but the warning is for us now. Like, don't get caught up in this stuff. Live with less. Learn to be content now. Simple pleasures. Come out of her. You need to dismiss and detach and disentangle yourself from the world system and all of its approval and how much money you think you need to make and how much stuff you need. It's time to downsize. It's time to live with less. We need to abandon this system. Inflation is going up. They're, they're going to have the purse strings for a lot of things in the future, so make sure 
we build a bridge bunker and we can all live together somewhere right, with our own farm land. And, like, we, just be smart. It's interesting because uh, I'm doing a wedding in the next week and I was talking to this couple about marriage and stuff and I brought up 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul's passage in, to the Corinthians. It says, do not be de bound together with unbelievers. Um, it's like a key principle to marriage, like he wants you bound together. But I'm like, it actually applies to this passage. Don't link yourself with systems that are going down. In this case, let me read the passage further. It says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Bilal? Or, or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Or what argument has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said. So Paul does a good job of just saying, look, we are called to be the new Jerusalem. What does that have in common with the Babylonian system? Like, those don't go together. Don't be bound to that. Don't get caught up in that. James says, pure and undefiled religion, James 1.27, in the sight of God our Father is to keep oneself unstained by the world. Don't get soiled by this system. And he goes on to say, friendship with this system is hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4.4. 4. Now, he's the half-brother of Jesus. He does not mess. He's like, I have seen way too much craziness. Can you imagine being the half-brother of Jesus and all the things you would have seen? And with? He's like... No, let me cut to the chase. You're a friend of the world system? No. You're hostile, you're an enemy, you're not on God's side. You, you can do whatever, go to church as much as you want, own as many Bibles as you want. You're a fake, you're a poser. Thank you, James. <coughs> Anyways, he says, get out, so the passage goes on to say, so that you will not share in or participate in or get mixed up in or caught up in her sins so that you will not receive her plagues, her disasters, her judgments. Exodus yourself from the system. Verse 5, and this is a very clever verse, for her sins are piled up, kalao, to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Her sins are piled up to heaven. This is very interesting because remember the humanists build the Tower of Babel and they tried to like build a tower of bricks and this word kalao is the same as like bricks being mortared together saying they never really got that tower. God destroyed it. But their sins, oh yeah, that's reaching all the way to heaven. The, you could build a tower of their sins. Super playful, I think. Uh, the Lord always has a sense of humor. Super cool. Basically... Well, as Led Zeppelin would say, what? They're climbing a stairway to heaven, right? <laughs> yeah, with their sins, they are. They really are. And God has not forgotten it. He's remembered. Because there's times you're like, God, are what? You, you really can't tell. I mean, what are you doing? It's like, got it. <laughs> it's duly noted. Be patient. I got it. Verse 6, give back to her, she's given. It's payback time. Pay her back, in fact, double. Twice as much as she gave out. Double the double is actually what it means in the Greek. Pour her a double portion, I love this part, from her own cup. <laughs> Why waste a good silo cup when we've got her cup already here? Let's give her a double portion of her own medicine. She's glorified herself, she's exalted herself. She's given double iniquity to the world. Give her double the punishment. By the way, that is part of the Mosaic Law. So this is not totally novel in Revelation. If you go to Exodus 22, the Mosaic Law says wrongdoers were often required to pay double restitution for their crimes. So this is an application of that. Israel received double for her sins, according to Isaiah and Jeremiah. And Jeremiah prayed that God would crush his persecutors with twofold destruction, Jeremiah 17, 18. So this principle is not brand new, but it's like, you know what? Give Babylon double, like 
two doses of vengeance and destruction. Now, by the way, vengeance is God's alone, not ours. Uh, I'll give you a couple verses just to remind you. Proverbs 20, believers must not say, I will repay evil. Instead, they are to wait for the Lord and he will save them. Romans 12, bless those who persecute you and don't pay back evil for evil to anyone. Um, you must never take vengeance, but leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is his. If your enemy needs to be fed or is thirsty, give him a drink. Uh, that's your role, but see to it that no one repays another with evil for evil, 1 Thess 5.15 and 1 Peter 3.9 not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. So just a little caveat there. Vengeance is coming from the Lord, not from us. That's not our role. Now, we can civilly disobey as the first Christians did in the first week of the church. You know, we're going to render to Caesar and government what is Caesar's, but we're going to render to God what is God's. And not because we like rebelling against government, but sometimes what the government says and what God says are different, and we're going to have to do the best we can to be charitable, kind, and compassionate, but we're ultimately going to do what God says. But we're not going to repay evil. That's God's thing. That's why, that's why us guys, right, we go see those movies like The Punisher. It's so great. He gets wronged, and by the time the end of the movie, they're just Killed. He got him back. And it's like, oh, that feels so good. Because <laughs> in real life, it's like, we don't get to get him back. We have to wait. We have to wait. And it feels good because it feels just. Like, you can't get away with that stuff. But we, we can let it go because when someone insults us or does something wrong or heinous, you can feel pity for them. You can just go, wow. Okay, I want to do something, and maybe legal action is appropriate, or some consequence is appropriate, or some response is appropriate, but retribution, vengeance, and all that, you're going to have to deal with my dad. That, that's why I'm going to shake the dust of my feet off, turn the other cheek, and go the other way. Not because you're getting off the hook. <laughs> Far from it. I couldn't do half of what. I mean, I pity you now. I'm really concerned. You're going to be meeting with my dad, and he gets, he's really, like, protective of his kids, so... There you go. Anyways, verse 7, our final two verses. Give her as much torment. Give her the same extent, if you will, of torment and grief as the glorying or the flaunting or the self-adulation and, and luxury that she gave selfishly to herself. And in her heart, she's boating. She's gloating arrogantly. I sit enthroned as a queen. I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. You'll never see me cry. I'm always happy. Oh, yeah. No. This is a proverb 16:18, which you know, right? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a <laughs> fallen, fallen. Babylon has fallen. Therefore, verse 8, for this reason, in one solitary day, within 24 hours, her plagues, her disasters, her consequences, her judgments, it's, it's going to overtake her. Just all these years of trying to build up this system and climate change and the Green New Deal and redistrib re redistribution and all the craziness. This is going to be so much worse than the stock market crash of 1929 and 2008 and it's it's like watching the World Trade Towers it's the whole systems just gonna within 24 hours death mourning famine and then she will be utterly consumed it means burned up it means incinerated by fire For mighty and strong is the Lord God who judges her. A time is coming that God will just say, enough. Party over. Game over. So, you know the nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. One day Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men, they, they're not going to be able to put Humpty back together again. No, because it's D-Day. 
And before D-Day, God in his graciousness uh, says, flee, like get out, reject globalism, resist the godless system, retreat from evil, don't participate in the crony, capitalistic, consumer, commercial, greedy, materialistic, hedonistic stuff. Doesn't mean don't make an honest dollar, don't, don't worry about working hard. Sure, make investments while you can. There's nothing wrong with enjoying God's pleasures. We want to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. But don't get caught up in the system. And don't do something shady and don't cut corners and don't participate in demonic temptations. Don't participate in the sins of this system. Don't love this world. Don't be conformed to this world. Make sure you're detached, dismissive, and disentangled from all the yuckiness because the last word for this system is going to be judgment. And you really are going to have to pick because what we see in chapter 17 and now 18 is you're either going to be a part of the citizenship of Babylon or the citizenship of heaven. Like you're either going to align with God or the godless. You're either going to cooperate with the world system or you're going to belong to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus prayed in the high priestly prayer, Lord, I don't want to take them out. I want them to make a difference in this life. So it's not like he wants us in some monastic holy huddle somewhere, but somehow we're supposed to live in the system, but not be of the system. I know that's super hard. It really is super challenging, but that's why we're here. Otherwise the Lord could just beam us up today. The donuts are even better in heaven. They're going to be super good. But he leaves us here because he wants salt here to deal with the rottenness. He wants light here to deal with the, the darkness. That's why we meet. And you're either going to be in the customer logs of Babylon or you're going to be written in the rolls of God's book. And that's where you are written. So today, just a reminder. The end of globalism is coming. The secular world order is doomed. Get out while you can. Amen? Amen.